The big idea that I am concerned with is after 25 years of teaching in universities, I realized that how we teach is actually out of sync with how we learn at a profound physiological level. I'd like to share an example of you, which is obviously anonymized. Somewhere in Europe, at a very prestigious university, a very esteemed scholar gave a lecture on psychology, but it could have been anything at all. It could have been about marketing, and it could have been a, a, a military officer doing a briefing to his uh, team in Iraq. And that's what it looks like. You probably find it a bit familiar. It's a tendency that we have to use this software called PowerPoint, or Prezi, or SlideShare, or Slide Rocket, all the other stuff that's out there. And what we do what someone called shovelware, which is we shovel all the stuff we used to give students and audiences in the old days before we went digital onto a slide. <clears throat> and it lasted for two hours. And this was the student feedback on it, represented visually. The key issue in my presentation is to see if we can actually remember and value the simple term, a picture paints a thousand words. If there's anything that I want an audience to leave this session with, it's just to remember that and to have felt its impact. At the end of that special lecture on psychology, as it turns out, the lecturer said, and here's a picture in case you're a visual learner at the end of two hours. And we can take an awful lot away from that, that statement. But the most important thing uh, for me is how it unmasks this giant gulf between how we teach and how we learn, as if somehow we don't learn with our eyes, as if somehow the idea of images is irrelevant to our learning, to our understanding, to our probing and interrogating the world around us. Now, he wasn't the only one. It would be very unfair to criticize any one individual. NASA have trouble using PowerPoint. The army blames half the problem in Iraq for having to sit through deadly PowerPoint presentations. Marketers and sales pitches, charities applying for funding from the government, they all do these kind of presentations. All this attempt to connect with an audience to explain something complicated and sophisticated. And we seem simply to have forgotten that those of us with the gift of sight are visual learners from birth. So that's everyone who can see is a visual learner. If we think back to when we were tiny, we were just fresh into the world, then we were learning and probing the world through our eyes. We didn't learn to read until much later. Our entire sense of what the world means to us, the creation of the ego and everything that goes with that, was formed through our eyes and through listening, and there sounds that we couldn't fully interpret, but our eyes full on from the moment that we open them to see. And that stays with us until we lose our sight, um, either prematurely or, or in old age. Uh, a guy called Peter Felton says that this is even more important because we as humans have entered the most profoundly visual era in all of human existence. And in that sense, this is an evolutionary turn that Felton's talking about, this pictorial turn. It marks a shift from an old way of being to a different way of being. In 2013, a quarter of a trillion images were uploaded to Facebook alone. Facebook's not the only place where these images are deposited. And the number of people making images is increasing, and the software to do it with is increasing in value and accessibility, like Photoshop, for example. And within seconds, Google will let us find those images. All we have to do is search in a, type in a, t a search term, and Google will locate the pictures for us. But that's what we get when we get taught. That's what we still get when we go to conferences. That's what we still get when we're attending sales pitches. That's what we still get on a day-to-day -day basis. A pre preference, a dependency on a very old way of learning. And it's delivered with this. And there's no escaping from it. PowerPoint is universal, isn't it? It's, it's everywhere we go. And it's, it's that inescapable kind of thing. I had the privilege of teaching at the Royal University of Phnom Penh in 1991. And they didn't have PowerPoint because they didn't have electricity either. So that was the only way that I could escape from being exposed to PowerPoint and to this devastating syndrome, death by PowerPoint. 
Most people will have experienced it at some point in their lives, either as students or as business managers or as audiences at other conventions. Now, a guy called uh, Norvig, who was Google's primary communication director, he said that PowerPoint was more dangerous than a loaded AK-47 because you could actually cause more harm to more people with PowerPoint. He was absolutely devastating of it, but I'm not, so, I'm not quite so sure that we should leave it as simply as that. But what I would say is that the way that we get communicated to normally, through these slides, through presentations and so on, it's dark ages methods, but we're in a digital era, in a revolutionary different era, where images come to the fore. It's ways of communicating. And I was as guilty as anyone else of doing that. My slides were packed full of terrible, terrible text. And the tables got turned on me. I actually saw what it was like for my student audience when I went to a conference and the people at the conference were giving the presentation and the stuff was coming to me like those slides full of text and so on. And I thought, I'm disconnected from this. And in addition, the speaker is saying what's on the slides, so one of them's redundant. And I'm thinking, this is so inefficient and it was just a feeling and that's all it was really. It was just a sense that something was horribly wrong. And so I kind of was looking out for something else, and I found various software packages, but we were all using them the same way. I wasn't doing any formal academic research. And then I came across creative advertising. Now, creative advertising has been around as long as advertising has. If you watch the TV series Mad Men, those guys on Madison Avenue in the 50s, they were the masters of this. But we now have Photoshop, and we now have trillions upon trillions of images accessible within nanoseconds through Google's searches. And those images, they did something profound to me. Not because it's a particularly gory subject, may or it may not be, depending on what it is, but because I suddenly found myself in the image and exploring it, wondering about its meaning, putting together the various component parts of it, understanding that there it was in full public view, that it was legitimate because she was not behind bars, that woman carrying the remains of an animal and that there was no mistaking that there was great pain, great emotional connection in it, and we know that the World Wildlife Fund was behind all this. And I found that a story was being told in one image, and I started looking at lots of other creative images, and I found that they held my attention like no ordinary lecture ever has done. They made me interrogate the subject. They made me engage in something called active learning. So when you're in a normal kind of a conference or a lecture session and someone's banging on at you, what you're in is in a passive mode. It's just you, they're on send, you're on receive. There's no interaction going on. But with images, what was happening, it turns out, is that I was forced into engaging with their meaning, no longer simply listening and copying down stuff from a lecture slide or a conference meeting and so on. And I realized that, in addition, I was experiencing affective learning which is learning through emotions. Now, a lot of critics say we shouldn't bring emotions into all this kind of stuff, and it's not this and it's not that, but we learn emotionally. Who doesn't learn from the pain of grief or the joy of love? We learn profoundly important lessons through emotions, so why not have them included? And the academic material says that there's nothing harmful about that. But I was enjoying it. That was the big difference. It was enjoyable for me. That's how I felt, but I couldn't say that with words. So I'm showing you a picture. That's what it meant to me. That was the difference it made to me. So I wanted to know what made it work. And I had to do some serious research into this. This was when my actual professional research skills came into play. Before this, I was, my, peace, my research areas were peace building in places like Vietnam, Cambodia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. And it occurred to me that I have to be quite careful because why throw away PowerPoint? Because a lot of important people have told us to. Maybe it's not PowerPoint. Maybe it's how we use it. I thought, it suddenly occurred to me, look, I wouldn't, <laughs> if I read a bad article, I wouldn't criticize Microsoft Word, would I? So why are we criticizing PowerPoint? Perhaps it's the way we use it, or perhaps it's the way that the software makes us use it. And then I came across this guy, Professor Distinguished Richard Mayer of the University of Santa Barbara, California. He's done so much stuff on psychology and cognitive processing and all the rest of it. And his work and the work of dozens of people from the last five decades have pointed to the same thing. If you chuck tons of text at people, their brain melts. That's the scientific side of it. That is actually harmful. And here's why. Because it overloads our short-term memory. 
Do you know how hard it is to remember successive telephone numbers? Try, try remembering successive telephone numbers. It's quite hard. That's how our short-term memory is. There's only a limited amount that we can process in the moment. So if we're getting tons of slides full of text and we're trying to consume those, we get what was called cognitive overload. And at the same time, we're force-feeding our eyes with the same stuff that's going in our ears that the lecturer is saying, or the speaker is saying, or the conference leaders are saying. It's like a car engine running on only two cylinders instead of four. Mayer and all the others call this dual processing. He says it's just something that physiologically humans do. We've got eyes and we've got ears. We process visual stuff through a visual cortex and audio and textual through an audio textual cortex. It's simple. Images for the eyes, words for the ears. That's the fundamental split, but that is not how people communicate with us on stages like this, in lecture halls like this, at battalion briefings like this, and so on. A picture's worth a thousand words. I could not say what that image means to me, or any of the other amazing images that are out there and easily accessible. There is a profound attachment between those two living organisms that says so much. But the point is that what is being said is being said visually. It's an example of how we learn, how we understand the world, how we engage and interrogate it. It brings a message to life. This is the school run in Labak in Indonesia. This is actually a story of corruption and underfunding by state department. And the paucity of the state in highly underdeveloped areas. That's the school run. And that's the story that's told in this image. Images can help us make the unfamiliar familiar. So many people have heard about desertification. That's what it would look like to a home audience, to some group of people who were used to being in the UK, who'd never imagined what desertification could actually mean. They can make a connection with it when it's rendered closely to somewhat something that they're already familiar with. And they can reveal these opaque connections. This one is very obviously a blood diamond, and the movie made this concept famous. But what's being told when I talk about that image is a story about capitalism and the arms trade and natural resources, and consumption, and a dozen other interwoven things. And I'm not repeating on the screen with text what I'm saying out of my mouth. I'm letting the audience absorb it in ways that don't overload one of the two channels we use to process. I love this one by the artist Christoph Kotciak. It's an epic story. It's evolution in one picture. From the beginning in our sea origins, the DNA strand connecting outwards to the torn body of the transforming human, breaking out of the dark sea into a primordial sky. Evolution in one image. And it makes real the unimaginable. For me, this is how it might have looked if someone in the Twin Towers had just turned at the moment the aircraft hit them something that we find it very hard to convey in words. Now, I thought, we'll trial this. We'll see if it actually works. And because I'm a lecturer, I had access to dozens of guinea, pig, guinea pigs for free. I tested my student reactions. I applied it in normal lectures. And then I ran some tests with control uh, and ra uh, random and test groups. There's two colors to pay attention to. And you can see the difference between the two. And it's that difference that I would ask you to think about. The questions across the bottom were given to students who looked at slides done the usual way and students who looked at them done this way. The blue, that was the people who looked at the slides done the old-fashioned way with text only. And the yellow is text and slides. And the questions concern things like, the slides help me remember the message. The slides help me understand. The slides... Uh, made the lectures enjoyable or the experience enjoyable. It was a dramatic difference and it was tested over three years across nine disciplines at Loughborough University. 
and then we did it for dyslexic students as well because the last time I did a TEDx talk, one of the audience was a dyslexic student and she came to me afterwards and said, I can remember every word you said about all those pictures. And I said, that's very interesting. Why don't we sit down and have a chat about that? And we did and then she joined the research circle and then we applied the same test to dyslexic students. And all of a sudden, the differential matched that of neurostandard students. It's not just students. It's not just this kind of audience. It's audiences anywhere that have to be sent or given or communicated complex information. For example, supposing you're at a job interview. How on earth do you differentiate yourself from all the other people who are probably reasonably similar to you, with similar backgrounds and experiences? Well, one of the ways to do it is to change how you communicate, to transform how people receive you. That one says, I'm not bound by convention. It's different. This one says, I'm empathic. This one says, I'm a team player. Although, technically, two of the red arrows are missing, so the team leading is not going so well there. If I was going to try and sum up what I want people to understand, to know, and to feel, I would say audiences aren't waving. They're drowning. They're drowning under a wave of text being sent at them in ways that their brains cannot process efficiently, which overloads their capacity to understand, to recall, to learn, to interpret. What I would say is we need to match teaching and communication to learning and understanding. We've got a physiology. It isn't in dispute, those two processing channels. We're, using, we're overusing one and underusing the other. Nourish the eyes, not just the ears. I would suggest, I think it's an antidote to death by PowerPoint. One of my students came at the end of a lecture and said, Dr. Roberts, that's bliss. And I laughed and I thought, well, actually, it's stuck in my mind. I really, really like the term. It's overdoing it a bit, I understand that. But at least it's not as harsh as the normal way of using it. Picture paints a thousand words. I couldn't say that picture in a thousand words. And there's nothing extraordinary being done. This is all PowerPoint, what's going on behind me. You've done almost everything that you need to do already, if you've done PowerPoint, to do this. It's about four extra clicks. And all you're doing is changing the background, looking for pictures and changing a background. But I think the results are extraordinary. It's an ordinary process, but there are radically different outcomes.